So out of curiosity, how many people here is at your first in-person net? Can we give these guys a round of applause? That's amazing. And I'm very excited to be here, excited to open up for the first training message. And let's see, all right, perfect. For those that have, let's see, I think I'm gonna wanna, hello? No, actually, I'm gonna, yeah, can we do? I wanna make sure, there we go. I wanna move around a little bit. Okay, so for those that have been to NET before, um, I typically like to have some type of theme for each of my messages. So last year it was virtual. You guys remember the Yegmen for those that were in attendance. It was basically like a safe cracker. And then the year before that, it was talking about the mo when the movie Ford vs. Ferrari came out and doing the perfect lap and what that looks like, perfect demo in Cutco. So, of course, this year, I needed a theme. So we're gonna be using chess as our analogy. Those that have coached with me before know I love analogies. So we're, we're using the grand master, becoming a grand master. For those that don't know too much about chess, uh, grand master is pretty much the highest level you can achieve in that realm. There's only about 2,000 people on the planet that have obtained that title. And did anyone see Queen's Gambit? Great, great show. Um, some of my inspiration came from that. So chess, chess is a game of strategy. And step one is to obviously know what each of the pieces do. But obviously, that's not enough to win a game of chess. All right, you have to anticipate your opponent's moves. And so when playing chess, you know, if one strategy gets blocked, you have to rework a new strategy. Most importantly, how the pieces lay on the board dictate how one should play the game. And what's interesting about this is this has a similar correlation to us at the booth, handling objections and navigating through the concerns of customers. To me, pieces are like scripts, right? Pieces like, all right, bishop does this, knight does this, rook does this. Those are like scripts. But how they're laid on the board it is going to tell a different story. So today, I like to do things a little unconventional. Um, we're not gonna be talking about scripts. You guys can get those from your coordinator or someone in your division. Uh, we're gonna go beyond that, and most of you probably know that if you've had a conversation with me. So my intention for the day and for my message is to give you guys a rendering of how my mind works, and thus being able to help you guys understand not only the rules that I play by, but how I essentially look at the board. All right, so scripts, in my opinion, are like 2D, two-dimensional, and I like to play in more of a five-dimensional realm. And so I'm gonna share with you guys some of those things. Before we do, though, I wanna talk about why this even matters. So the number one reason why it matters is it's gonna increase your average order. Of course, selling packages, cookware, flatware, all those things are gonna increase your average order. But none of those things actually matter if what? If you don't close, right? If you don't handle the objections along the way. If you've ever played chess and you're like at the end of the game and you have like two or three pieces left and you're trying to checkmate your opponent and you like keep moving around and you can't quite figure out how to checkmate them, that's typically what happens if you don't have the right skill set. Now, if we just simply think about all the orders each of you had behind the booth last year, 
right? And I know it's gonna vary for different people. Um, maybe 100 orders, 200 orders, 300. If you're Curtis, you had 1,800 orders behind the booth. Um, but I'm gonna use 200 as like just a baseline. All right, and if we take those 200 orders and we multiply it by 1.2, that 0.2 is to represent lost opportunity. The orders that you didn't close, the signatures, the flatwares, the ultimates. That 0.2, well, that would be 40, right? 200 one times 1 1.2, that would be 40. If we use the average order of, let's say, 1,500 bucks, because what are the orders that end up like walking away. It's not typically the five piece orders, it's the thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollar orders. Well, 40 times 1500 is 60,000 CPO. All right? That's a lot of CPO. That's $30,000 in income. So, what I'm going to teach you guys here today is going to help bring that income. So, I'll put my Venmo at the end of this message so you guys can send it to me. All right? Second thing. It's the highest productivity activity you can do, right? You're already invested into the customer. You've already spent 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes with the customer, right? That extra five, 10 minutes at the very end when you're handling the customer's concerns, that's what matters the most. That's what either makes or breaks the order. And the third thing is don't give away your walk-ups. <laughs> So we all have had walk-ups, right? Customer walks up, hey, I'll buy the ultimate. Great, here's your credit card, okay? Well, where do those come from? Well, there's a few places they come from, but one place it comes from is the previous rep, right? A lot of you guys in the room that did the demo, couldn't close, they were this close, didn't have the language to close it, and then they come back six months later and buy from someone else, or a year later and they buy from someone else. Those are the walk-ups, right? So, Really, today, I want to give you guys the skills that are going to allow you to not give away your walk-ups. Does that sound good to everybody? <laughs> All right. So, a couple things of what not to do. All right, I think it's important to start here. Don't sound like you're reciting the script. I heard a couple chuckles. So... <clears throat> Memorize the script, but add your personality, okay? Memorize the script, but add your personality. Add pauses, be authentic. You sound inauthentic if you're just regurgitating the script. Don't think about what to say next, right? Be fully present, fully engaged with what the customer is sharing with you. Listen intently. Second thing, don't be combative with the customer. Now, I'm not talking about that 70-year-old man who wants to tell you, you know, if, you know a 17-degree angle is better or this steel's better. We've all had those. You know, you don't need to get into a competition with them there. I'm talking about the customers where maybe you're having a rough day, maybe your neighbor is, has sold more than you, and you know, customer walks up and they're like, oh, Cutco, I've been looking for you guys. I've been wanting to buy a set. So you go through the demo, 20 minutes, 30 minutes in, and they're like, great, awesome, do you have a card? And how frustrating that is. And you're like, you literally just told me you wanted knives. And it's easy to be very uh, combative with the customer, right? Because you're telling them, you, you heard one thing, but they're now telling you something completely different. All right, but in those moments, it's important to take a deep breath, relax, get curious. Why do they feel this way? Why do they feel like they need to walk away and think about it? Like similarly to chess, all right, you don't want to be swapping pieces too, too quickly on the board. Okay? Grandmasters are only going to like do the piece swap if they know that at the end of the game, or at the end of that exchange, they're gonna be better positioned than the person that they're playing against. Don't assume. Some of you guys are really good at this, or assuming. 
So just because a customer knows the, like, just because there's a past customer, someone who's bought before, doesn't mean that they necessarily know the prices of Cutco. So it's really important for you to not cut any corners. The same thing applies with, don't assume you're gonna have a home run just because they walk up saying that they've been dying to get Cutco, right? Make sure you dot your I's, cross your T's. If something is unclear, be sure to ask. Write this down. Ask questions you already know the answer to. Ask questions you already know the answer to. The reason why is because just because you know the answer doesn't mean the customer fully is acknowledging or taking ownership of that answer. And so when you ask a question and they have to tell you, whatever they say is now an agreeance that you guys have both heard the same thing and then you can move forward. This is a big one, don't talk too fast. All right, I've, I've seen CSPs behind the booth and they're like, yeah, and the pairing knife does this and they get, and you get, give like 20 names and uses for the pairing knife. Or you're talking about the guarantee and you're like, chips, cracks, fades, cracks, blah, 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 blah. Right? Too much information, right? Slow down because even though you've said that same sentence a hundred times, this is the first time they're hearing this. So if you slow down, they'll really be able to internalize what you're actually saying and you don't have to repeat yourself and you can actually make sure it lands versus just you know ricocheting off and them only hearing every other word. All right, <laughs> don't discount the order as soon as they give you an objection. Thank you. <laughs> In my opinion, that's a lazy way to sell Cutco. And it's also inefficient. I'm sorry if that triggers you. That's just my personal opinion. I think this is important to write down though. Most object ob objections given by customers don't require extra discounts. Most objections given by customers don't require extra discounts. What they do require is understanding, right? Being on the same page as your client. I feel that you actually sometimes break trust with customers if you lower the price. You're like, hey, well, I was gonna sell it to you at this price, but now I'm gonna sell it to you at this price, right? That breaks integrity, in my opinion. So stay firm on the price. Also puts more money in your pocket. To be a great chess player, you have to know what the best move is. Now that might seem obvious, but if you ever watch this TV show, she's like a brilliant chess player and she plays all the possible chess moves in her head before she actually makes a move, making sure that she's gonna make the best possible move to give her the best opportunity. All right, the best move isn't necessarily just the words that are said after hearing an objection. You have to have mastery over the intangibles, right? Anyone can learn how to play chess. Anyone can know what each piece does. Everyone can learn how to respond to objections. Customer says this, you say this. But we're not here just to learn how to play chess, right? We're, learn, we're here to learn how to become a grand master. And what I wanna teach you guys today are gonna be six intangibles that I believe will have the biggest impact on your guys' objection handling skills at the end of an interaction with a customer. So, you guys ready for those? Yeah. All right, number one. Be an unbiased listener. I posted a little hint in my Instagram for those that follow me. Move in silence, only speak when it's time to say checkmate. All right, it's really important to listen with the intent to learn and understand. Listen more than you speak. There's a reason God gave us one mouth and two ears. Some of you guys talk way more than you need to, right, to try to close a deal. Typically, this happens when you really want to close a deal, so you stop listening to the customer, and you start forcing the customer in a direction you want them to go versus the natural direction the customer wants to go. 
don't jump the gun. Some of you need to write that down. Don't jump the gun, which basically means let the customer finish their thought fully, right? Let them finish their thought, thought, you receive it, you acknowledge it, right? And then you respond. They're gonna feel more heard, more understood. When you cut a customer off, they subconsciously acknowledge that you're not listening to them, right? Because you're playing, oh, they said think about it, so I need to say this next. They need to talk to their spouse, I should say this next. Make sure the customer feels understood so that you can really understand their perspective. Next one, be inquisitive. Otherwise known as ask really good questions. Be really curious. I think it's important, and I've learned this over the years, right? I got really good at asking questions, and so then my questions became just a game of like trying to pin the customer down in their own words, and I got really good at that, but I was realizing I was running into a roadblock, so make sure that when you guys are asking these questions, you're coming from a place of service, really to serve the client, and not just strategy. In relationships, you know, they talk about you and your spouse. It, it's not you versus your spouse with the problem, it's you and your spouse against the problem, and the same thing applies when you're working with a customer, right? It's not you versus the customer and the objection, it's you and the customer versus the objection, right? Get on the same side as them. Work together as a team. If a customer feels that, you'll, get, you'll uh, just make a lot more progress with your clients. Ask questions multiple ways so it, it evokes different answers within customers to help them help you get clarity on what they're thinking and how they're feeling. One of my favorite questions to ask is, hey, I'm just curious, if we found something that you would use and that fit in the budget, would you be open to getting that today? It's a great way to qualify when you're mid-pitch. And sometimes they'll like go off in the distance and like say something completely off the wall, didn't even answer my question. And what you'll notice about me is I'll ask the same question again, but maybe slightly different until I get an answer, all right? And it's not until I get clarity of the answer that I move, move forward. So I might then ask the same question slightly different. I say, hey, question, what if we found you a package that came with pieces you would use and it was at a price point that you could budget? Is that something you'd consider getting today? And if they say yes, then your job is only to do what? Find something that fits in the budget and comes with pieces that they're gonna use. A few other questions here that you wanna definitely uh, integrate into your pitch. Hey, what are your thoughts? It's one of the simplest questions, but one of the most effective. Customers walking away, they're like, hey, can I get your card, thanks. I'm like, yeah, here's my card. Hey, by the way, before you leave, what are your thoughts on this package? Right? And they have to come back, answer that question. This also gives you time to process and come up with a solution. If, one, if the wife is talking but the husband isn't talking, hey, what are your thoughts? Right? Get the husband talking. That's actually one of my favorite is you're, you're working with a husband and wife, and the wife, you can tell, really wants Cutco but is like hesitant and is looking to the husband for approval, but the husband doesn't even care because he's like, I don't cook, whatever she wants, right? And some of you guys are smiling like, I, I've had those situations. So what I'll do is I'll say, hey, Mr. Jones, I can tell that your wife Sally here really likes Cutco and is really excited to get this, but I can tell she's a little hesitant because she wants your approval. And I know you don't cook and you're not in the kitchen so you don't really care, but I think it's important that she hears from you that this is something that you would support her in. So my question for you, husband, is considering what a great cook she is and considering the fact that she's been wanting Cutco for a long time and that it's guaranteed and American made, if she wanted to get a set today, would you support her in that decision? Yeah, of course, she can get whatever she wants. And then it just like, breaks down the, the barricade right then and there. This will be recorded. 
you'll get that. This is a quote that I, I love, that I live by. The art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. The art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. Improve the quality of your questions, you'll receive higher quality answers. All right, next point. I think this is number three. Ability to create a safe space. It sounds like a therapy session, but I promise you this works. The more comfortable a customer feels with you, the easier it'll be to overcome an objection. Now, it's really important to clarify, comfortability does not mean more rapport, okay? Some of you guys build rapport and rapport and rapport, and you're spending 45 minutes with a customer and losing out on turns, okay? So what, when a customer is comfortable, really what you want to cultivate is four things, connection, presence, listening, and being curious. Connection, presence, listening, and being curious. Hey, so tell me more about that. Why do you think that is? Another great tool you can use is repeat the concern or the objection back to them. So you feel like you need to talk to your husband first and then just pause. And then they, most customers will feel the need to justify their objection and what that does is it helps you get more clarity on where the objection is coming from and where the fear is beyond that. Why do you need to talk to your husband? Is it because he makes all the money? Is it because he cooks? Is it because you made a purchase recently? Right? All those data points matter. It's really important to meet customers where they're at versus forcing your agenda. Meet customers where they're at first, forcing your agenda. I was sharing that with Danny Garrido the other day um, because he was forcing his agenda in our role play. And I told him, like, just meet customers where they're at. And two days later, he called me. He's like, yeah, I was talking to a customer. She didn't really want to buy right now. But I was like, I remembered what you said, meet customers where they're at. So I just decided to connect with some of the other things she was dealing with personally for like 20 minutes. And then at the very end, I was like, hey, by the way, like our price increase is right around the corner. Do you mind if I just share with you some of the specials? Sure. 10 minutes later, $4,000 order, right? So sometimes you just got to meet customers where they're at. And then once you have that traction, your you know, synergy with the customer, then you can move forward. Another example of this is, actually, we're, we're short on time. I'll save that. We'll have to skip that one. All right, <clears throat> number four, transparency. This is one of my favorite. Be direct, okay? Talk about the pink elephant in the room. There's a quote by Dalai Lama, a lack of transparency creates distrust. A lack of transparency creates distrust, which means transparency creates what? Trust. Right, so it's important to be transparent. It's important to be direct. It's a breath of fresh air from the customer if you're very direct, because most salespeople aren't. A little workarounds, beat around the bush, right? They're very pitchy, right? So instead of doing that, be direct. Hey, what's the biggest thing stopping you from wanting to pull the trigger right now? It's a great question to ask. What's the biggest thing stopping you from wanting to pull the trigger right now? Get to the root of it. If you really wanted to, Mike, could you fit 400 bucks a month into the budget? If you really wanted to, could you fit 400 bucks into the budget? That gets straight into the point of can they budget it, yes or no? And so the reason why I have this scale here, it's like a balancing scale, right? Is because on one side is the objection. Hey, I need to think about it. Right? And so it's your job to help them think about it right there on the spot. Okay? Help guide 
their thinking process. And so if there's nothing on either side of the scale and then they give the objection, right? Now it's tipped one way, the objection. I want to think about it, right? And then from there, it's important for you to tip the scales in your favor. So, hey, I totally understand you want to think about it. I'm just curious, if you really wanted to, could you fit 500 bucks a month into the budget? Great. Awesome, and I'm sure I don't need to sell you on the value of Cutco. Is this, you know, you can see that this is an investment. I mean, at the end of the day, what else can you spend $3,500 on that you're gonna use every single day for the rest of your life? Don't worry, I'll wait, All right? So it tips it a little bit more, all right? And obviously you're gonna use this, right? You can see how you and your family are gonna use this and get value out of this, great. And this is something that you've been thinking about for a while. Is it safe to say you'll probably get this set eventually? Awesome, so considering all those things, knowing that you can fit it in the budget, knowing you're probably gonna get it eventually, and that this is the right set for you, if I went out of my way and did something a little extra special, so you felt really good about just pulling the trigger now, would you be open to that? Well, of course, right? But it's important to check off all those points beforehand. You can't just give the turbo deal. You can't just give the extra crazy discount without making sure the customer is acknowledging that all those things are true and that you guys are on the same page. And my turbo deal is like two gadgets, all right? So in, in the analogy of chess, right, towards the end of the game, you're minimizing the, the moves of where the king can go, right? Block this row, block this angle, right? Minimizing and closing in. That's what you're doing in, the, in, in this game. All right, next one. High emotional intelligence. Now, I could probably give a whole message on this. Obviously, I don't have time for that. But it's important to know the definition. The definition is your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and in others. If you feel like you lack emotional intelligence or that you can improve in this area, you should buy the book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. Why it can matter more than IQ. Daniel Goleman, I would recommend it. The moment you master your intelligence, the game changes. It's basically like seeing the next move before it happens, right? Going from 2D to 3D. And at, at the end of the day, you guys know this, right? Body language says a lot more than words. 93% of communication is what? Nonverbal which means 7% is the words you say, which is why, yes, you still need the words, they're like the puzzle pieces, the script, but 93%, that's what it is actually doing the communication. It's not about what the customer says, it's about what they mean by what they say. These were my favorite scenes in Queen's Gambit. Um, so one of the things she would do, so obviously the, the, the final point here is reflect. So her name's Beth in Queen's Gambit, and she would always take time to reflect on her matches. And so she was very gifted, and she would play the matches in her head, and they use this as a, um, in the show. But she would review them, right, to, to review her games, to see where she could improve, how she could get better. The question I have for you guys is, do you spend 20 minutes after a long workday reviewing where you could have improved, how you could have closed those few people? If you did that every single day behind a booth, I promise you, you would get vastly uh, just better. Another thing you could do is record yourself, right? Try recording yourself, a voice memo, and then listening to yourself talk. Oh, that was, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, that was good, right? Improve from that. So that's my invitation is to help you guys up level is literally just take time to reflect. So last minute here, what I wanted to do is pose a question of what would be possible if you committed to becoming a grandmaster this year? 
right? If you really committed towards reflecting, improving your emotional intelligence, in, in, increasing your transparency and directness with your clients, creating a safe space so you can create a dialogue and work through the objections together, right? Be inquisitive, ask questions, be an unbiased listener. What would be possible, right? You guys would sell 10, 20, 30, 40% more working this, not improving in any other area of the business. So what I wanted to do just in wrapping up is I wanted to leave you guys with a little token of my message and also for it to be a reminder. So I just need like four volunteers if you guys can come up to the stage, whoever wants to be a volunteer. And what I did oh, is I bought like, I don't know, four or 500 chess pieces. Spent, <laughs> spent a few hundred bucks. And if you can split this up, probably uh, four bags per. There, sh there should be enough for everyone to get something other than a pawn but there may be a few of you that get pawns. But here's what I'll say, if you do get a pawn, I got a couple quotes here. There are times when a well-placed pawn is more powerful than a king. Second quote, every pawn has the potential to become a queen. And the last one, and this is a quote by a pawn, right? I walk slowly, but never back down. So maybe you relate to the pawn a little bit more and you prefer to have that, but I want everyone to have one piece. And I want you to take that with your like kit, your events kit. And so every time you just have it right behind one of your red boards and reminding yourself of the commitment of becoming a grand master. And I look forward to talking to you guys next year and all the improvements you made. Thank you so much.